a frying pan used as a mission tool in a jungle village in Myanmar, Camp Polaris touching the lives of many families in Alaska, and a hospital in South Korea that began treating patients under trees. This and much more coming up next. Hello and welcome to Mission 360, coming to you today from Tunisia in Northern Africa. Tunisia has a rich history and I'm standing in the, uh, the remnants of the ancient city of Carthage, just on the outskirts of modern day Tunis. And behind me are the baths of Carth Carthage and, and you can see here that this is quite a structure. Uh, these baths were more than public places where people came to bathe. They're also centres of commerce and community and learning. Some of these baths even had libraries attached to them. And as we look at the rich history and we see that this was once filled with luxurious villas and paved avenues and all the opulence that the Roman Empire brought, as we, we look at how kingdoms crumble, how people's dreams just turn into dust. And I'm reminded from the prophetic books of the Bible how there's only one kingdom that will endure. And that's what all Adventist Mission is all about, the kingdom that will endure. And around the world today, men and women are sharing good news about that kingdom. And first up, let's travel to Myanmar to see how a frying pan is being used for mission. In a jungle village in Myanmar, this frying pan has been a key tool to sharing Jesus with villagers. Mian So works as a global mission pioneer he came to this village with a special mission, to make friends and share Jesus with the villagers. He takes a unique approach to meeting people. Everywhere he goes, he brings his frying pan. When he first arrived in this village, he began visiting people in their homes and offered to make them flatbread. The people here love this flatbread, but no one else in the village knows how to make it. So, Mian So was constantly invited to people's homes to share this special treat. Once they get the fire going, they prepare the dough and roll it into balls. An important part of making this bread is the technique. The villagers watch closely as he flips the bread over and over to get just the right shape. As the bread is cooking, Mian So talks to the villagers about life. This way, they get to know each other on a personal level. Through this process, he has made friends throughout the village. When he first came, there was not a single Adventist, but now there is a small home church of 15 Adventist members who meet multiple times a week for flatbread and discussion. Mian So always ends his visits with a short Bible reading, a song, and a prayer. For most, this is their first time hearing the amazing stories from the Bible. They are captivated by Jesus and his role in their lives. As this congregation continues to grow, Mian So asks that you say a special prayer for his village. Pray that through simple but creative approaches, like making flatbread, more villagers can come to know the love of Jesus. Thank you for supporting Global Mission pioneers around the world. Next up, we have a wonderful story of a woman who is working with her community in beautiful, holistic ways, particularly with the women in the village. Thanks so much for being here to share your story with us. Tell me, what sort of things are you doing in the community where you're working? Well, I'm doing a co community work. Uh, I'm targeting the women and the teenagers, but it also involves the men and the youth. Um, it was, the, the women were, were a starting point, but that with the women, uh, I gained trust in them and they gained trust in me and then we spread this work. It's not me only, but it's, uh, it's the group, group work, so it has extended to men also and youth. Wonderful. How did you start? 
Well, when I went to the village, I got in touch with a group of women, actually before, because we had a project with Adra in that village. And the women were um, the big part of the beneficiaries. So uh, I got in touch with them. And in fact, they got in because they recognized me when I went after two years. And they invited me in their group. And uh, I started observing what they were doing. And I said, oh, maybe I can do uh, some work with them and I can have some impact with them. So um, it's in uh, uh, like a micro enterprise in uh, uh, essential oil extraction. And so they were just in the, uh, in the process of producing, but I helped them in the packaging and the way of selling it and marketing it. So, and the little success that we had that last summer um, really encouraged them to open more up and then we started other things with that. So you're extracting essential oils from a certain type of plant? Yeah, it's uh, myrtle and lavender mainly. Uh, well, these are the main, but there are other medicinal aromatic plants there that grow on the mountain and uh, and but mainly myrtle and mastic oil also. So this may gives you an opportunity to make friends. Oh, actually, well, I started with a group of three, and it has extended to thirty. So within three months, because when the women they um, they told their their neighbors and the the neighbors came, and um, it was good because to it was an opportunity to reach them, but also to help them to diversify the, uh, the work because those women were in myrtle oil and uh, uh, I got others where they were living near um, the plant mastic and then we, they could have mastic oil. So it was good. So I, I was able to replicate uh, the, the process uh, with different groups of women. Were there any barriers against you? Were there any um, bridges that you had to make to people? Were you treated with suspicion? Well, yes and no. That's a good question because the fact that I'm local, that on the, the other side, I'm Christian, and, um, and that uh, how to, to adapt my... Um, practices, I mean, my Christian faith in the environment. Uh, so that was a little bit of challenge. But they have come to respect me. At first, they didn't know I'm Christian. And, but when I said I don't work on Saturday, it's when the market day is and when they can make a lot of profit. I mean, not a lot, but some profit on that day. And the visitors come to the village. Um, yeah, at first they were, but, but then I, I, instead of just being like, no, no, I cannot do, but uh, I said, okay, we can have a picnic, we can go on to the forest, we can have this, we can have a storytelling. And that was wonderful, especially when I told them once the story of David, and they were, wow, so it was just wonderful. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now tell me about the jam making. Oh, that's, that's really God's providence, I have to say that. Mm, it was one Sabbath that um, uh, I decided that uh, to have um, a picnic with the young women. They were not part of the group, but I wanted to reach them. So I invited four and we went to the forest. We just make, made sandwiches and we went there. And on our way back, we spent nice time there the whole morning. On our way back, in the, one of them said, wow, now it's, uh, the fruit has started growing. And I didn't know the fruit. So, in fact, it's the arbutus fruit. Um, and I've never seen it. I've never tasted it. So she just picked one and then I, she gave me and I said, wow, it looks nice. And well, I just took the picture and then I Google it and 
I said, wow, in the, we can make jam and no one knows. I mean, I've never. So I, the, the, the other next uh, week, I collected some fruit and then I went to another one of those ladies and I said, wow, can we make a jam? She said, wow, she was astonished. And then her mother was present there. She was one of the group, the mom, and uh, um, one of the members. And then we started making, and wow, it was delicious. <sighs> the fact is that um, we did it in the afternoon, and it, we spent a long time just testing the process of making it because I didn't know how to do it. But anyway, when we got the product, I'll, I figured out that the sunset has already there and it was getting dark and I'm living in the mountain in the forest so to get in the I mean in the night I was new so uh, yeah I couldn't find my way so I went to the local cafe just normally it's not good for women to get but I would say okay just let me ask for someone to help me and escort me to there and one of the men I met a group of men in front of the cafe it just was I didn't want to enter, but I just met them outside. And they said, what were you doing? Why are you out this time? You know that you should be at home. So, because it's not dangerous, but it's good to be at home because when it's dark, it's dark. You cannot find your way. And I said, well, I was making a jam. Actually, can, would you like to taste? And they taste as well. I said, what? Wow, that's a good jam. What is it? And we can taste it. There's something that we knew. And then I said, Okay, guess what? And then so guess they couldn't figure it out. But when they realized that it was this fruit, so they took it out inside and the whole cafe, I can say that maybe there were 70 people and people started coming out to say, and in fact, they called me inside and they said, oh, would you like to, uh, that we collect this for you? If you are going to make, please let us. And I said, yes, well, you can. I was. I didn't realize that the thing will will be so big. So well, I went to to, to the capital, and uh, and one while I was uh, at at my home, one of the the villagers just phoned me, and I said, he said, oh please, stop the guy from collecting fruit. I said, what's happening? He said that, I mean, they have collected a huge quantity. I had to return back quickly and just to weigh, it was one ton. It means 1,000 kg. Wow. And ah, uh, it was really, I had to mobilize 28 people to make this one ton. Unfortunately, I had to throw 300 cages, but we had a lot of jam and it's a blessing. Wonderful. And so it just keeps growing, huh? Yes. Wonderful. Actually, now, I mean, it's... Uh, it's a social enterprise for the village. Fantastic. And, yeah, that's given hope for them. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. The um, is mine. And it's a wonderful story. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back to Tunis. Behind me is the Zaytuna Mosque. It's been standing here for more than seven centuries. Next up, we travel to Alaska and see the church impacting the lives of many children. I'm in what has to be one of the most beautiful places in the world, Camp Polaris in Alaska. And I'm joined by Lori Hosey. She's the camp director here. Lori, how long have you been? This is my 16th year. Okay. I'm working camps. Okay. And I understand that this camp is a mission camp. Yeah, it's a, it's a mission in a lot of ways. It's a mission because it's financed by mission money and it's also a mission spiritually because most of these children either haven't been exposed to the gospel or the Bible and the stories that are in there, or they have and they just need a clearer view of what that means in their lives. Have you seen a lot of the children's lives changed? I have, I have, yeah, through the years. Over 16 years, we started out, you start out with the ones that were eight, year old, eight years old then and you know they're 24 now and just watching the different ones um, just progress and change and become closer to God and be better than what they could have been because you, of camp. Can you tell me a couple stories? I have a, um, I have a staff 
for example, that started out when he was eight going to camp. And he just grew up in the camp and he was a, a little helper then, but his background is his mother was alcoholic and he had been adopted by his aunt. And um, in the process of going to camp and being in a, in a more spiritually nurturing environment, um, he has become like my right hand man. He's in his 20s now and he's just like on it. He's been watching all these years how things work and operate and how to help and he's the one I can depend on to know where oh, things are at and wonderful. get it done. Just a right hand man. Yeah. yeah, and I look at him, when I look at him, he's, he's native. Yeah. And um, when I look at people that have come out of the system he came out of, you know, there's just a lot of drugs and alcohol that they've fallen into. And they're, I, I see the, the drunks on the streets in Anchorage, and I look at this young man and say that's what he would have been if he hadn't wow. had this influence in his life. Yeah. yeah. I've noticed that you have a couple of Native Alaskans on your staff. And it really is their camp. Yeah, right? I mean, yeah, they're they're here. taking ownership, and yeah. uh, they're going to be the leaders of this camp. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Well, any other stories? We have, um, you know, there's just a lot of stories that come out of these. All these kids come with something, and the staff come with something, and while they're here, their lives get impacted by Christ. And you know, I was thinking of the other day. I have uh, campers that I see now as adults. And I have campers that just come year after year. One of them, their sister had committed suicide. And those two boys now, since then, have um, started going to Adventist schools, even Adventist sporting schools, and attending church. And, and they still have the struggles of the village life, but now they have tools to combat it. When they get back. When they get back, right. Yeah. So it's just rewarding. Kind of get them through the year, and then the next year you yep. build on that later. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And hear their experiences. They share with us what they ran into and and what tools they use that they got at camp to combat that. That must so be really. It is. It is. It's just like you know what. Um, buildings are no buildings. Our lives are complete when we hear that the the mission of this camp is being fulfilled. You know, I, the buildings add, they add <laughs> huge. <laughs> but just the. You don't want to lose yeah, those. You don't want to lose those. But um, you know, it's just that it's going forward in the hearts and lives of these people. It's not about the buildings, although they're wonderful, mm -hmm. but it's about the hearts and lives that have been changed through this camp. And I, you know, I have one in, in town now, he's working at the airport. Yeah. Teens, he comes out and he contributes back to the camp now. He, he'll he take my my staff out on tubing rides because now he can drive his own boat. And See, and I'm, it's just, just giving that, back. Just yeah, camp, and he right? comes back and he says, what can I do to contribute? Yeah. Can I bring you something? You know, one of yeah. them brought firewood one time. And it's like they're, yeah, they're giving back and, yeah. and they're keeping track of what's going on and are the kids getting what they need? And, and, they, and they want this, this new generation to have what they've had. Yeah. Because I understand that like grandparents, and the grandparents came as kids and yep. the parents yep. and the grandchildren. Yep. And Does they want to keep that going? Yeah. And what's cool is that they're not just here to help meet the needs of the campers. They're like looking out after my staff now. Like, you you guys have what you need out there. Can I bring you anything from town? Now. <laughs> yeah, I guess we're in. <laughs> so it's exciting. Um, do you have a theme? We have a theme this year. Every year we have a different theme. This year is royalty. And the theme is what we're trying to instill is that we're all children of God, whether we accept okay. that or not. He's our father and he's going to love us as his own children. And because he's God of the universe, biggest of all, our dad is actually the biggest, greatest king ever. And that makes us royalty. Mm -hmm. And so we want to learn to live like we're royal in the sense that he came as a mission to save because of his royalty. And we want to instill that too, and that you are valuable and you are precious. And, and no matter what anybody else says or thinks or does, you're a valuable person. In fact, we had a camper that um, just recently was came to camp feeling like nobody loves me. I'm I'm Aww. I'm not valued. There's no purpose in this life for me. And by the end of the week, she was sitting at we have a banquet, a royal banquet on Sabbath, and she was sitting there saying, you know what, you know what, God loves me. And I do feel royal. I feel like a princess. And, and this was real. This was yeah, conviction. Yeah, that she, it, it just kind of like changed her view of herself and how God feels about her. And who cares what the rest of the world thinks? God loves me and, and, and I'm valuable. How they see each other. 
Oh yeah, yeah. The the way they treat each other instead of you know just like someone to pound around on it. It's like I got to be careful. They're royal too now. <laughs> they're God's children too. That's and yeah. I know their dad, and he's pretty powerful, and I don't want to mess with that. But oh, that's fun. but you know just knowing yeah. that everybody's valuable. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's wonderful. it's exciting, and for them to get that concept and take it back to wherever they came from, is is powerful tool. It's a powerful tool. Lori, it's been a privilege and a lot of fun to be able to spend a couple of days here with you and your staff and, and meeting the campers. Viewers at home, I want to thank you for supporting this mission camp with your, your funds and with your prayers. I ask that you continue to remember Camp Polaris and its mission in this community in the future. And if you would like to learn more about mission projects like this, please visit AdventistMission.org. Thank you. The Adventist Hospital in Seoul, Korea has a wonderful reputation in the community and through the years it's touched the lives of thousands and thousands of people. In the early days they didn't have a building and so they served people out under the trees, they were pulling people's teeth, they were treating their medical conditions. But through a 13th Sabbath offering 50 years ago they were able to purchase their building and the ministry has just grown. Let's visit that hospital now. Can you imagine visiting a dentist under a tree or being baptized in a hospital? Through the years, the Adventist Hospital in Seoul, South Korea has done everything possible to reach the Korean people. Occasionally, this meant pulling teeth outdoors. Then, about 50 years ago, the 13th Sabbath offering overflow helped expand the hospital so that it could care for more people. This special offering promotes specific projects around the world that grow the church in tangible ways. These projects change lives, sometimes by supporting institutions that provide educational opportunities, medical services, evangelistic training, and more. One such institution was the Seoul Sanitarium and Hospital, which opened in the 1930s under the leadership of Dr. George Roo. By 1967, South Korea had endured both World War II and the Korean War, and yet the Adventist Hospital still stood. The former division president wrote, The present buildings have withstood the ravages of time and two wars. An entirely new plant is needed, and the amount to be realized from the overflow will be but a part of the full amount required. Land was sold to raise additional money, and donations poured in from church members and workers. The next year, plans were underway for the new hospital. The long-awaited day finally came. At the official groundbreaking ceremony in 1969, the details of the new hospital were shared. Utilizing the most up-to-date hospital design, this 160-bed general hospital will be the most modern and efficient in Korea, yet will be neither the largest nor most expensive. The hospital officially changed its name from Seoul Sanitarium and Hospital to Seoul Adventist Hospital so that the name would point to the Advent message. Ministering to patients, the hospital staff aimed to share the gospel. One patient was so impressed by what she learned that she pleaded to be baptized before she died. To make do, the hospital's physical therapy tank served as the baptistry. Ministry remained the focus, and the hospital bolstered evangelism and educational initiatives in the country. Medical clinics were offered in small villages where young people wanted to attend church, and the clinics helped win over their parents as well. More than 100 people were baptized as a result. One conference president described a 10-hour dental and medical clinic he observed. Dr. Robert Allen saw 150 patients resulting in 130 extractions plus fillings, scalings, and numerous consultations. Dr. Vernon Butler and Dr. Chun encountered everything from leprosy to tuberculosis as they treated 473 patients during the hours of the clinic. For 75% of the people, this was their first contact with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The construction continued, and an important building contract was signed. In addition to the 13th Sabbath offering, the necessary resources came from more land sales, operating funds, and fundraising efforts. The hospital expansion opened in July 1976. The day was a joyous one. This tremendous project was finally completed after eight years. S.D. Kim described the highlights of the 160-bed facility. The new hospital has central air conditioning and heating, piped-in oxygen and vacuum to every patient room, 
a speaker system throughout the building, and many other features make it one of the finest medical centers in Seoul. The Seoul Adventist Hospital has expanded and grown even more since then, adding services and increasing its patient capacity. It continues to be a beacon of health and healing in South Korea and cares for thousands of patients each year. The 13th Sabbath offering contributed to this first major building project, which captured the attention and hearts of Adventists around the world. Thank you for supporting 13th Sabbath offering projects, both in the past and today. You've made a difference in the lives of many of God's children. Well, I hope that you've enjoyed today's 360 degree view of mission around the world. From rural areas in Myanmar and Alaska, through to large urban areas such as Seoul, Korea, and smaller cities such as Tunis in Tunisia, we see men and women, boys and girls, who need to learn more about the love that God has for them. And around the world, we have so many frontline workers who are showing God's love in practical, holistic ways. And please continue to pray for these people in their challenging work as they share the love of God that touches people's lives. And I want to thank you so much for being a part of Adventist Mission because we consider you, the viewers, to be part of our team. You might ask, How, what do I do? And I say, well, you pray, you support financially, and you get involved where you can. And I want to thank you for that. And as a small thank you, I want to give you an unusual gift. It's a pair of chopsticks, which much of the world uses every day when they eat their meals. And as you use these chopsticks, as you look at them, it's a reminder of the importance of mission. Well, for Adventist Mission, I'm Gary Krauss, and I hope that you can join me next time right here on Mission 360. Thank you.